Fidel Castro could legitimately be regarded as either a hero or as a tyrant, or as both at the same time. In 1959, Fidel Castro rose to power in Cuba. Commander Castro, why are you leading a revolution? He has been one of the most controversial figures in the world ever since. It is not the same to fight for liberty as to fight against it. A political thorn in the side of the United States. Our sympathy goes out to the people of Cuba, now suffering under the yoke of a dictator. This is Castro's story, told through media reports. Fidel Castro, face the nation. Rare images. I have to be careful. And recordings. And it is not an easy job to come here and to speak with you, the reporter of the United States. Fidel Castro believed the CIA had been involved in a series of plots on his life. Some of this material has never been broadcast. Some of it has not been seen in decades. Do you believe that the dem democratic man ought to be afraid of any idea? Dr. Castro, you are a lawyer, and I'm afraid I will have to act as a judge. We'd like you to answer our questions. There are theories that you held President Kennedy responsible and that you were involved in his assassination. Did you have anything to do with it? Commander, what panel did if you were caught? I never would be casualized. Like Henry Adams, we say, give me liberty or give me death. This program was made possible in part by contributions to your PBS stations from viewers like you. Thank you. Cuba, the late 1950s. For tourists, Cuba is an exotic land of wonder. Gambling casinos, restaurants, luxury hotels, swimming pools, and miles of pristine beaches. Just 90 miles from the United States, Cuba is a playground for Americans. But for many Cubans, life on the island is no paradise. In the island's interior, far from where tourists stay, poverty runs rampant. The education and healthcare systems are poor. Living conditions rival those of any third world country. Much of the blame for the nation's vast dichotomy between rich and poor can be laid at the feet of one man, Cuba's president. Fulgencio Batista, former army sergeant, former general, holds the reins of power as backed by the army and by those who favor government by a strong man. Batista denies he is a dictator and says some of his opponents are pro-communist. But his strong arm methods and the constant threat of inflation have kept political opposition bubbling. It's estimated by his rivals that during Batista's reign, more than 20,000 political dissidents have been killed. The mountains of eastern Cuba. After years of fighting, it is here that the raging of revolution thunders through the jungle canopy. Men and women have taken up arms and launched a bloody guerrilla war. To them, Batista has destroyed Cuba. Their goal is to oust him from power. Their leader is a charismatic Cuban who says he will fight to the death to liberate the people of Cuba. His name is Fidel Castro. This is Dr. Fidel Castro, 31, holder of four university degrees. We finally get our news cameras into Castro's headquarters. Castro's top lieutenants are Argentinian-born Che Guevara, who participated in an unsuccessful revolution in Guatemala, and his brother Raul Castro, an avowed communist. Fidel Castro is the son of a Cuban sugar farmer and comes from an upper middle class background. He is one of seven children. Even at a young age, Castro is brash, outspoken, and willing to take risks. Castro attends a Jesuit boarding school and earns a law degree from the University of Havana. He becomes emboldened 
by nationalistic philosophies. In 1952, Castro runs for Congress to help improve Cuba. But before elections are held, Batista takes power in a military coup. In response, Castro gathers a group of anti-Batista revolutionaries. They plan an attack on the military barracks in Moncada. Castro believes by taking the barracks, they will acquire enough weapons to begin an uprising against Batista. The raid takes place at dawn on July 26, 1953. Castro will use this date, July 26, as the moniker for his future revolution. The attack is quickly put down. Many of the rebels are killed. Castro and dozens of others are captured. At his trial, Castro utters a phrase that will come to define him. History will absolve me. Castro is sentenced to 15 years in prison. Two years later, Batista buckles to international pressure and releases political prisoners, including Castro and the others who attacked the Moncada barracks. In 1958, they gather again in the Sierra Maestra Mountains to fight Batista's soldiers. Commander Castro, why are you leading a revolution? I am leading a revolution because the legal government of my country was overthrown by the army led by Batista. 82nd days before a general election in which the people of Cuba was going to elect its own government. And instead of that, General Batista established a bloodly tyranny for finishing that tyranny and for re-establishing a legal government in my country, we are fighting now. So what did you seek to accomplish in coming here, and what do you feel that you are accomplishing by being here in these remote mountains? It is not the same to fight for liberty as to fight against it. All the people of the Sierra Maestra are with, with us. We have struck the spark of the revolution. Batista was not the one to admit that he is incapable of defeating us. Castro's leadership is precise. He stations scouts throughout the mountains. The rebels always know where Batista's soldiers are, and the soldiers have no idea where Castro is hiding. What is your political philosophy? Are you a communist or a Marxist? There is not communism or Marxism in our ideas. Our political philosophy is representative democracy and social justice in a well-planned economy. Up until this point, the United States government has supported the Batista regime. But with world attention now focused on Batista's strong-armed rule, the United States withdraws its support. It will not back Batista or Castro's revolutionaries. The United States has embargoed arms for both sides. Occasional shipments are smuggled through from rebel sympathizers. It is an unequal battle of idealists against tough professional forces. As Castro, if I lose, I'll start over again. If Batista loses, he loses for good. Cuba's strong men seemed untroubled by Castro's mounting offensive. Behind Batista stand the army, the police, and apparently Cuba's labor unions. Batista seemed upset about reports in the American press of police brutality and corruption, but confident in the face of an unpredictable future. After months of fighting, revolutionary forces wage a battle for three days before making a move into Havana. The final holdouts of Batista's soldiers are driven from the city. Castro's ragged band of revolutionaries, exhausted from three years of non-stop fighting, stormed the capital. 
their struggle to remove Batista from power is about to come to an end. New Year's Eve in Havana. Fighting was reported in Las Villas province between the soldiers of Fulgencio Batista and rebel units. A few hours later, 4 a.m. Havana time, New Year's morning, a phone call. And the report Fulgencio Batista and his coterie had fled in surrender. From his stronghold in the wild Sierra Maestre Mountains, Cuba's Fidel Castro emerged triumphant after two years of guerrilla warfare against the Batista regime. A revolution that began with Castro a fugitive, practically alone, landing with 82 followers to be nearly wiped out by government forces, ended with the flight of dictator Fulgencio Batista and the entry into Havana of rebel forces to be acclaimed by the city. In his lifetime, the bearded cigar-smoking idealist has become a legend. For most Cubans, this is the first glimpse of the man whose name became a byword during 25 months of guerrilla fighting. It's a simple matter to know when a revolution has begun. It's not so easy to know when a revolution has ended. This has been and is the revolution of Fidel Castro. The Cuban people admire Castro because his rise to power is not from a military coup d'etat, but a popular revolution. Castro is a dynamic speaker. He's persuasive and filled with fire. He's abundantly endowed with the high confidence and the humility of a biblical prophet. Fidel Castro with the doves of peace sitting on his shoulders as he surveys the crowd that is tonight celebrating Cuba Libre. Fidel Castro, face the nation. In the early hours of yesterday morning, this was the scene in the studio of television station CMQ in Havana, Cuba. Dr. Castro, could you tell us what your opinion is of United States policy during this period of your revolution? Do you want to tell you the truth? That's all we want. <laughs> Do you see those chairman tanks? Do you see those airplanes? Do you see those big bones of 500 pounds? They were sold by government of the United States to Batista. Despite his criticism, Castro wants to maintain good relations with the U.S. But that does not stop him from enacting brutal reprisals at home. In the months following Castro's rise to power, hundreds of Batista's loyalists are put on trial, sometimes in Havana's sports palace. Batista aide Major Sosa Blanco, charged with 200 murders, faces a military tribunal. Three judges still wearing the revolutionary's jungle battle dress. Says Blanco of the crowd, I am in a Roman Colosseum. Forty-five witnesses come forward to tell of acts of brutality and murder. Men, women, and children testified. The decision is death. Nearly 500 of them are found guilty. They are executed by firing squad. Shortly after the executions, nearly a million Cubans show up for a speech by Castro to defend the killings, saying no nation stood up for his country's people during the atrocities committed by Batista. When the Palace was a miserable traitor, a criminal who killed over 20,000 of our compatriots. Those campaigns were never made against Cuba. In an effort to sway public opinion, Castro begins a tour of nations in South and North America starting in April 1959. Huge crowds show up to see Castro, who is now a symbol of revolution. His reputation soars as a populist leader. Fidel Castro accepts an invitation from the American Society of Newspaper Editors and visits the United States, even though Batista loyalists in America want him dead. A tumultuous welcome for Fidel Castro. A cheering, singing, flag-waving crowd of thousands greets the Cuban revolutionary leader and premier 
As on arrival, he pushes past police and security guards to return the enthusiastic greeting, despite rumors of assassination plots against him. Castro was hugely popular with the American public. Along with his immense charisma, he is seen as an island version of Robin Hood, who has brought freedom to an oppressed people. Despite Castro's popularity with the American public, the government is wary of the Cuban revolutionary's communist leanings. Outside Penn Station, police break up a demonstration by a few supporters of Cuba's ousted dictator Batista. And Castro, in a record slow time of 24 minutes, crosses the street to his hotel, almost swamped by the excited crowd. It's one of New York's most enthusiastic receptions for a visiting notable in quite a while. Though Castro condemns the U.S. for supplying arms to the Batista government, he attempts to make peace with America. I came here because I was invited for the editors. What happened is that here, you in the United States, are accustomed to see government coming for, for money. No. I came for, for good relations, for good understanding, for good economical relations. We are now poor people, but in a rich country. What we want is to work in our rich country. Our guest likes rifles and cigars. But as a very young boy, he took up a typical Cuban sport, the breeding of fighting cocks. It is my pleasure to present to you Dr. Fidel Castro. You have said, sir, that dictatorship is impossible if public opinion approves. Did not Hitler, Mussolini, and Perón have public support? We are against all kinds of dictatorship. We are against all kinds of dictators. That is our idea. Mr. Prime Minister, what is your impression of Vice President Nixon? <laughs> I got really a good impression of uh, Vice President Nixon. Nixon has a different opinion. While in Washington, U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower avoids meeting with Castro. Instead, he sends Vice President Nixon to meet with the Cuban leader. Nixon's opinion of Castro? He needs to be watched carefully. You won a revolution before, sir, against great odds. Now you're fighting what might be called a social revolution. Will this be more difficult? Well, this is uh, harder than the other. Because in, when we were during the war, it was, it was only a matter of fighting. Now it's a matter of produce and to create and to take care of all the matters of the country and all the cities. Because the Batista government had looted Cuba's treasury, the leaders of the revolution discover they don't have enough money to run the government. Though the U.S. public has embraced Castro, the United States government doesn't trust him, fearing he is a communist. And though he initially had said his country did not need help from the United States, Castro realizes Cuba cannot survive in its current condition. But the U.S. refuses to give Cuba any additional aid. Instead, Castro turns to the Soviet Union for help, further stoking the fires of the Cold War between the Soviets and the United States. In January 1960, the Soviet Deputy Premier, Anastas Mikoyan, came to Havana. The stage had been set for him. Mikoyan opened a Russian trade fair. He discussed deals with Cuba. By the time he had put this hat on his head, he had the Cuban economy in his pocket. In Moscow, an agreement was signed for the exchange of Soviet machinery and technicians for Cuba's sugar and other big money crops. U.S. President Eisenhower threatens to cut Cuban sugar quotas to the United States. A third of that sugar is produced by American-controlled companies. The Soviet Union agrees to purchase one million tons of Cuban sugar annually. Fidel Castro, in a bitter anti-American speech last night, warned against the United States cutting Cuban sugar quotas, threatening to take over American-owned sugar mills. 
But the Rules Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives today cleared for floor action a bill to give the president the authority he wants to reduce the marketing of Cuban sugar in this country. After a month's long power struggle, Eisenhower bans all sugar imports from Cuba. In response, Castro seizes all U.S. companies in his country. Many communist bloc countries have promised to take Cuban sugar in exchange for the things Castro needs. It looked easy, so I thought I'd cut a cane or two for Castro myself. You hold that. Just like that. Just there. Cut it that way. Oh, made it in one. Can I have that for a moment? You know... This could cost me my American visa. After months of Castro seizing American businesses, the United States enacts a trade embargo against Cuba. That embargo still exists today. There is a limit to what the United States and self-respect can endure. That limit has now been reached. Our sympathy goes out to the people of Cuba now suffering under the yoke of a dictator. Secretly, the United States looks for a way to remove Castro from power. But the U.S. does not want its own troops invading Cuba. Instead, President John Kennedy agrees to have U.S. military advisors train Cuban exiles. Their goal? To invade Cuba at a small cove on the island's south side, called the Bay of Pigs and remove Castro from power. This is an NBC special news report. Cuba tonight is an island in revolt. Against the revolutionary forces of Prime Minister Fidel Castro, another revolt has begun, and Castro's strange and wild career may be approaching an end. It is advisable to say maybe, because everything will depend on whether the people of Cuba and the army are loyal to Castro. Dawn, Monday, April 17th. Bay of Pigs, Cuba. The first units of the brigade reached the beach without opposition. Among them is Humberto Diaz Aguilas of the 2nd Battalion, H Company. A soldier from the rear yelled, We are an army of liberation. We came to fight communism. The militiamen answered, Fatherland of death, long live Fidel Castro, and the shooting began. The assault has begun on the dictatorship of Fidel Castro. Landings were effected by rebels at several places on the Cuban coast, and the rebellion against the red tinged dictator was on. The invading troops receive no support from the people of Cuba, dooming hopes that the exiles can win through a popular uprising. More than 1,400 Cuban exile soldiers invade the island. Dozens of them are killed, and the rest are taken prisoner. At 3.45 p.m. Wednesday, April 19th, resistance ends. In less than 72 hours, Castro has destroyed the brigade. The American plan, financed, trained, and backed invasion of Cuba is now a total failure. For many Cubans, 
Castro's revolution is wrong from the start, but most are afraid to speak out, fearing they will be arrested or killed. Good evening. Each week, almost 2,000 Cubans find they have had enough of Castro, so they get out and come to Miami, Florida. The Cubans generally advocate a return home by military invasion with American help, but there is no evidence of any plan to try that again. So while they wait for something to happen, they just wait. They want to stay here to help in any moment with a gun, with a rifle, to fight against Fidel Castro. And it's those refugees that give the United States news that Castro has made a deal with Premier Nikita Khrushchev of the Soviet Union. The exiles say the Soviets are bringing more than economic aid to Cuba. They are bringing weapons. Just a few moments ago, White House Press Secretary Pierre Salinger indicated that Mr. Kennedy's remarks will concern a matter of the highest national urgency. We do know also that the president has been meeting with high officials of the government throughout this day in an atmosphere of near crisis. OK, now we're ready. Here from his office in the White House, the president of the United States. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. I call upon Chairman Khrushchev to haul and eliminate this clandestine, reckless, and provocative threat to world peace in response, the United States begins a naval blockade of the island, stopping and searching all ships bound for Cuba. Havana Radio said tonight that Cuba's armed forces have been put on an immediate 24-hour alert following President Kennedy's speech. This is his first public reaction to the American arms blockade, and Castro was bitterly angry. He said the United States undertook the blockade because all its other efforts to destroy the Cuban Revolution have failed. The hopes of mankind are concentrated in this room. The action we take may determine the future of civilization. I have taken the necessary steps to deploy our forces to be in a position to make effective the quarantine at 2 p.m. tomorrow, Greenwich time. A la una y 45 de la tarde, el secretario general interino de las Naciones Unidas, UTANT, invitado por el primer ministro Fidel Castro, para discutir sobre la crisis internacional planteada por el bloqueo naval impuesto por el gobierno de los Estados Unidos a Cuba. En las reuniones de la representación del gobierno revolucionario con la delegación de las Naciones Unidas presidida por UTANT, Cuba fija con claridad su posición ratificando los cinco puntos de la declaración del primer ministro Fidel Castro. No existirán las garantías de que habla el presidente Kennedy contra una agresión a Cuba si además de la eliminación del bloqueo naval que promete, no se adoptan, entre otras, las siguientes medidas. Over the next week, Kennedy and Khrushchev send letters back and forth, each demanding the other back down. The turning point in the crisis comes on October 27th, President Kennedy agrees not to invade Cuba and proposes to pull U.S. missiles out of Turkey if Khrushchev removes his missiles from Cuba. A day later, Khrushchev accepts the offer without consulting Castro. Castro is furious that he is cut out of the conversation. We will not, of course, abandon the political, economic, and other efforts of this hemisphere 
to halt subversion from Cuba, nor our purpose and hope that the Cuban people shall someday be truly free. Despite Kennedy's declaration that Castro must make his people truly free, years pass with no change. Cuba is separated from the United States by 90 miles of ocean and 15 years of history. Geographically near, Cuba ideologically forms part of another world. Fidel Castro is its one familiar figure. Dynamic, eloquent, authoritarian. He's a man who could legitimately be regarded as either a hero or as a tyrant, or as both at the same time. It had been two years since our last visit to Cuba. What we found new were a marginal increase in the living standard, with signs that this might get better still, a growing reliance on the Soviet Union as a model in all things economic. What we didn't find were any indication of a relaxation ideologically. This regime is based on mass mobilization and thought control. Outside the framework of Marxism-Leninism, freedom of thought just doesn't exist. It's an unwanted relic of the past. What would you like Americans to know about you and Cuba? And could you possibly say it in English so they could understand? In English. I am not well in English. What well, could then in Spanish? Good wish for the people to the United States. Good wishes. Wish of understanding. Wish of friendship. I understand it is not easy because we belong to two different worlds. We are neighbors. And in one way or another, we ought to be, be to live in peace. Thank United you. States and Cuba. Though Castro is firmly entrenched as Cuba's leader, news of continuing efforts by the United States to do away with him becomes public. Senator George McGovern, who recently visited Cuba, told a news conference today that Fidel Castro believed the CIA had been involved in a series of plots on his life. Over a period of several years in the early 60s, congressional investigators determined there were at least eight CIA-led attempts to kill Fidel Castro. When Castro rose to power, two of the promises he made were to improve the nation's education and health care systems. His revolutionary government has created 10,000 new classrooms, and the schools are better than before Castro took power. And despite a lack of supplies, Cuba's doctors are some of the best trained in the world. And finally this evening, what we might call Medicuba, the story of what happened to an intrepid correspondent of ours, Fred Francis, when he went to Cuba to cover a political event and ended up with a medical event of his own. Calisco Garcia Hospital in Havana has one of the busiest emergency rooms in this hemisphere. It handles more than 700 patients a day. Only a handful of American hospitals like Bellevue in New York and Cook County in Chicago care for that many patients each day. And the quality of care here is very good. It is also free of charge. All health care for Cuba's nine and a half million people is free. I had to be rushed to the emergency room one morning. I was suffering with severe burning abdominal pain in my left side. I was in the hospital two days, and I could see evidence of the American economic blockade everywhere. Much of the equipment was old. This x-ray machine, used in a urogram test to locate my kidney stones, was rusted. There is also a shortage of basic hospital tools like needles, syringes, and even bedpans. I received good care and good drugs, in fact, American drugs. Medicines from the United States cost a lot more here because Cuba must get them through Canada and Mexico to circumvent the blockade. Castro makes a point of sending his well-trained doctors to left-leaning allied nations throughout the world. But it's not just doctors Castro exports. It's soldiers and weapons of war. Castro begins taking his hardware of revolution overseas. Sobre la cuestión acerca de si la lucha armada es el único camino para la liberación. Lo que puedo responder es que 
por lo menos en las condiciones de nuestro país, no había otro camino. Y en nuestra opinión, en las condiciones de la inmensa mayoría de los países de América Latina, no hay otro camino que la lucha armada. Y esa parece ser la situación también en muchos otros países de Asia y de África. Castro stays true to his word. He sends Cuban troops to assist a group of revolutionaries fighting for control of Angola. They are called the MPLA. By the most authoritative estimates, Cuba sent 18,000 troops to Angola. This army looks well equipped. It has new Russian weapons, amphibious tanks, and modern SAM missile launchers. The Angola Civil War begins in 1975 after Angola gains its independence from Portugal. The fight between two opposing rebel groups becomes a lightning rod of the Cold War. The United States and South Africa back the rebel group called the National Liberation Front of Angola. The Soviet Union and Cuba send troops and supplies to the MPLA. Castro's move to become involved in the war enrages the US government which feels Castro is exporting his brand of communism. Castro says sending Cuban troops to help the MPLA, which aligns itself with Castro's socialist beliefs, is his duty as a revolutionary. When se produce the invasion of Angola by troops regular of Africa del Sur, no we could not cross our arms. And when the MPLA solicited our help, in the late 1970s, some say his toughness begins to soften. Cuba's Fidel Castro has often been described as a man too ambitious for too small a country, a revolutionary, not a statesman, a man many Latin American leaders feared. But now some political analysts say an older, more moderate Castro may be trying to change that image. In 1980, as a way of relieving political unrest, Castro allows Cubans who wish to leave the country to do just that. Cuba's economy is suffering. Tensions are running high. Weary of Castro's economic and political repression, tens of thousands of Cubans flee to the United States. This action is called the Mariel Boatlift. Some two miles off the coast of Cuba, this is what you see, a single file procession of boats extending for miles on their way to the port of Mariel. The Cuban port of Mariel is jammed with ships of all sizes. At latest count, 1,300 boats have arrived here. These are the people the Castro government has called worms, bums, prostitutes, and parasites. What they do seem to be is a very happy people, happy to be leaving the country of their birth for a new start in the United States. Revolucionario, quien no tenga sangre revolucionaria, quien no tenga una mente que se adapte a la idea de una revolución, quien no tenga un corazón que se adapte al esfuerzo y al heroísmo de una revolución, no los queremos, no los necesitamos. Within months, 125,000 Cubans have immigrated to the United States. The boat lift has become a political nightmare in the U.S., with many Americans burned out from the non-stop arrival of Castro's Cubans. Many believe Castro is emptying his jails and sending criminals to Florida. At the end of October 1980, Castro closes the port of Mariel to boats from America. In turn, the United States government bans the arrival of any more immigrants from Cuba. The end of the boat lift comes five days before Ronald Reagan is elected president of the United States. During his presidency, the tough-talking Reagan does not mince words when it comes to Fidel Castro. Over the past few weeks, Fidel Castro has been making anti-American speeches and staging anti-American rallies as he celebrates 25 years in power. Last night, it was President Reagan's turn to mark the anniversary of the Cuban Revolution. The most important question remains, where is Cuba heading? Cuba's economy is incapable of providing you and your families your most elementary needs.
despite massive subsidies from abroad. But your leaders tell you, don't complain, don't expect improvement, just be ready for more sacrifice. But why are your leaders so unwilling to let you hear what others think and say? If the power of truth is on their side, why should they need to censor anyone's views? Your system, um, which you say works very well, um, it does presuppose that the leadership of the country, you, are, are always right. That you are infallible. Is that not so? No, it does not presuppose that. You will not see a statue of me anywhere nor a school with my name, nor a street, nor a little town, nor any type of personality cult. We have always been honest. We have always told them the truth. This people know that from the government, a lie has never been told to them. And I ask you to go to the world, tour the world, and go to the United States, and ask if they can say what I can say, that I have never told a lie to the people. But what if they do disagree with the revolution and their Cuban? Why can't they stay here and voice their opinion? We accept opposition within the revolution, not against the revolution. No one forces them to stay. Maria Shriver is the niece of former President John F. Kennedy, and she has a special interest in questioning Castro. Back in the early 60s, there were reports of many assassination plots against you. There are theories that you knew about these assassination plots, that you held President Kennedy responsible, and that you, in turn, were involved in his assassination. Did you have anything to do with it? I, I can't answer that question. I, I don't accept that. No, no, that, I cannot accept such a, such a charge. To plan an action against the President of the United States is something irresponsible, mad. Because I saw in Kennedy an adversary, an intelligent, a capable one. The day when Kennedy was murdered, I felt something empty. Actually, it hurt me. I must tell you very honestly, because I thought it was an unfair death. Throughout the late 1980s, Castro continues to hammer away at the American government, saying despite the U.S. embargo, his revolution is alive and well in Cuba. In his speech, Castro told a huge audience that the American embargo of Cuba had caused hardship, but was ultimately good, because it demanded that Cubans become self-reliant. But self-reliant is not self-sufficient. As Castro approaches the end of three decades of rule, his island nation remains strapped by the U.S. embargo. And there's no end in sight. On December 26, 1991, the bottom drops out on Castro's Cuba. The Soviet Union collapses. A major percentage of the Cuban economy is based on trade or aid from the Soviets. Without that influx of cash, Castro must now lead his people through one of the nation's darkest times. Many become desperate and risk their lives in rafts to escape Castro's Cuba. Castro calls this the special period. Estamos en periodo especial, un periodo difícil, un periodo uno de los más difíciles de nuestra historia. ¿Por qué? Porque no hemos tenido que quedar solos frente al imperio, solitos. ¿Y qué hacía falta para quedarse solo frente al imperio? Había falta unidad, pero hacía falta valor, hacía falta patriotismo, habría falta espíritu revolucionario, un pueblo débil, un pueblo blandengue. Un pueblo cobarde se rinde y vuelve a la esclavitud. Pero un pueblo digno, un pueblo valiente como nosotros no se rinde y no vuelve jamás a la esclavitud. Despite the massive economic struggles going on inside Cuba, outside of his country, Castro maintains the perception of being a world leader. In 1995, he travels to New York for the 50th anniversary of the United Nations. I am 
State of Union first in 1960 when you were here, Mr. President. What, and what happened? What happened to democracy? What happened to free elections? We discovered other formulas of, democra of democracy, and we discovered different formulas, a more honest formula to have the people participate. We discovered that it was better than the Americas. What? As he has done before, Castro is able to use his charisma to win over even his harshest critics. <laughs> but there is no softening of political relations between the United States and Castro. A Cuban military jet shoots down two civilian airplanes just one year after his visit to New York. Castro claims the airplanes violated Cuban airspace. The planes are from the United States. At the controls of the aircraft are four pilots from an organization called Brothers to the Rescue. The group gives assistance to Cubans fleeing their country by boat. All four of the pilots are killed. Just four days after Cuba shot the two U.S. civilian planes out of the sky, Congress and the president came to terms on the new steps against Cuba. The bill aims to economically strangle Castro by discouraging all foreign investment in Cuba. It will send a powerful, unified message from the United States to Havana that the yearning of the Cuban people for freedom must not be denied. The additional sanctions against Cuba include the right of the United States to halt trade with any non-U.S. company that does business with Cuba, forcing companies to choose, do business with Castro or do business with the United States. Three years later, the battle between Castro and the U.S. evolves into an unexpected war of words, this time in a custody battle over a six-year-old refugee named Elian Gonzalez. The boy was found floating in an inner tube off the coast of Fort Lauderdale. Friday, the bodies of two women were found off Fort Pierce in Jupiter, Florida, including the boy's mother. Six-year-old Elian Gonzalez now poses an international custody dilemma. Here he is playing with cousins in Miami, following the Immigration and Naturalization Service's pronouncement that he can stay in the United States legally with his aunt and uncle. The boy's biological father lives in Cardenas, Cuba, and said on Cuban television over the weekend he wants Elian returned to him. His relatives in Miami do not plan to comply. The boy remains a poster child for Cuban exiles. They've made him a mythical figure and a symbol of defiance against a communist regime. Fidel Castro has also made the boy a symbol, criticizing the U.S., as he says it, for kowtowing to the Cuban exile mafia. Federal agents arrived, 130 strong, under the cover of darkness, shortly after 5 a.m. The six-year-old was found in a bedroom closet with one of the fishermen who had rescued the boy off the coast of Florida last November. It is time for this little boy, who has been through so very much, to move on with life at his father's side. Yo diría que hoy es un día de tregua, quizás el único en estos 41 años. When George W. Bush becomes president in 2001, after a contested election with Al Gore, Castro wastes no time in criticizing America for the manner of his election. Castro says elections in his country are free from that kind of scandal. He was not elected, he was appointed president of the United States. Our elections are 10 times cleaner than the elections were like those in which he was elected. How can anyone talk about freedom of expression when a president needs $1.5 billion in advertising to sell an image of himself? Today, there is only one nation in our hemisphere that is not a democracy, only one. 
President George W. Bush calls for free elections in Cuba as a way to ease the United States embargo. There's only one national leader whose position of power owes more to bullets than balance. Fidel Castro has a chance to escape this lonely and stagnant isolation. If he accepts our offer, he can bring help to his people and hope to our relations. And the choice rests with Mr. Castro. Castro says the embargo is based solely on politics in the United States, and most Americans want it ended. But he fears lifting the embargo would create a different kind of disaster for his country. Let me know in advance so I can move away because an invasion of hundreds of thousands of American citizens is enough to make us move away. In July 2006, Castro undergoes surgery for intestinal bleeding. Cubans are notified of Castro's illness in an announcement made by Castro's secretary, Carlos Valenciaga, who reads a letter written by Castro. La operación me obliga a permanecer varias semanas de reposo alejado de mis responsabilidades y cargos. Como nuestro país se encuentra amenazado en circunstancias como esta por el gobierno de los Estados Unidos, he tomado la siguiente decisión. Delego con carácter provisional mis funciones como primer secretario del... en el segundo secretario, compañero Raúl Castro Cruz. Two years later, in 2008, Castro officially steps down, handing over his country's presidency to his brother, Raul. Raul Castro Rus. <laughs> U.S. President George Bush is in Rwanda when he hears the news. So I view this as a period of transition that, uh, and it should be the beginning of the democratic transition for the people in Cuba. Despite President Bush's hope for a democratic Cuba, as Castro's brother Raul takes control of the country, he vows to keep Fidel's vision for Cuba alive and well. The nation will remain communist. Raul Castro has said, the revolution has gone on for 50 years, and it will continue for 50 more. For those who believe in Castro's revolution, he will always be the father of the nation. His fight in the Sierra Maestra Mountains is the stuff of Cuban legend. Batista does not want to admit that he is incapable of defeating us. The charisma and complexity he showed from his earliest days of power never faltered. We know how to defend our integrity. At every turn through five decades, Castro defied the United States. Despite all his tools of oppression, Fidel Castro will need to answer to his people. What kind of government would you establish would you be president? We will establish a real representative and democratic government. I don't think in being president. I am not fighting for that, nor for any other charge. I cannot answer, I cannot answer you about myself because I don't think about that. This program was made possible in part by contributions to your PBS stations from viewers like you. Thank you. The Fidel Castro Tapes is available on DVD. To order, Visit shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS.